Hey everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 485, being recorded on the last day of January 2018. I'm Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Melvin Tunnel. Well, we are one twelfth of the way through 2018. Uh, It went by so fast. Yeah, yeah. It kind of did. Uh, Somebody was, I was on the phone the other day and somebody asked me, like, actually it was today. They're like, oh, so you made it through CES. And I was like, I paused for three seconds and it's like, that was only like two weeks ago. Feels like it. it no, it, it was, was only like two weeks oh, ago. Oh, well, that's because they did it later than usual. Yeah, Usually they screw you. it felt like you. it was forever ago. Yeah. We're so used to them know. screwing us out of like New Year's. It was almost. three weeks ago. Huh? It was what? three weeks ago. Was yeah. it like the ninth? Well, yeah, not the ninth. The, the ninth, ninth is like three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> what day did we come back? The 12th? I came back the 11th. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so regardless, it has been some number of weeks from that, but it's, it's January now. It's time to move on. Uh, we have a lot of, it's like earnings season, I guess, which yep. is when everybody wants to have their press conference and talk about which money they made or didn't make. And we'll, we'll talk through, uh, some of that Western digital Intel AMD. I don't have a story here on it, but we'll mention Qualcomm at least. Um, but thank you everybody for joining us. We are recording live 10 PM Eastern, 7 PM Pacific PC slash live. Uh, is where you can find us. If you need a reminder, if you want a little notification about the live streams we do, if you go to pcpro.com slash subscribe, ask for your name, ask for your email address, and uh, that's all we do is we use it to send out information to you about, hey, here's what we're going to talk about, here's the link, be here at 10, et cetera, et cetera. Josh is not allowed to spam, stuff like that. Just Much. Please, does YouTube own Just a YouTube.tv? Little. Yeah, it's for YouTube TV. Oh, okay, so it doesn't like redirect. <laughs> Okay, nope. that's fair enough. Uh, we still have our Patreon campaign up and running. Obviously, patreon.com slash PCPer. This is where you can go to directly contribute to us uh, for the creation of these videos, other videos, the reviews, editorials, Mailbag. all that type of stuff. Mailbag as well. Uh, this is your kind of monthly recurring contribution option. It could be a dollar. It could be $3, $5, 10 dollars 10 50 100 uh, Anything and everything is, is welcome and greatly appreciated uh, for everybody that does that. And... It allows us to create things like the mailbag, which is uh, where one of us sits in front of a camera in a microphone for about 20 minutes and talks to you and answers questions every week. Um, This week, it was me. Uh, This coming week will also be me. Next week will be somebody different. We'll figure out. Maybe Josh. Josh, you look like you want to answer some questions. Sure. I like answering questions. (laughs) Do you answer them uh, to completion? I answer them succinctly. Okay. So it's usually less than 20 minutes, like 18 minutes and 37 seconds or 1,114 <laughs> seconds. I'm just, waiting for, I'm just waiting for Josh Mailbag to be like, you know, four and a half hours one time just for funsies. Uh, on I've, one question. Yeah. On one. <laughs> the question would be like, hey, Josh, what's the best racing wheel? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Oh, so no. in 1992, Postmaster <laughs> oh, no. was oh, no. developing their first <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, all right, let's get into the stuff this week. We're going to start off uh, with a review of an SSD. That means we're going to talk with Alan about the Intel SSD 760P. Yep. Lowercase p, is that correct? Lower, okay, so here's how this works now. If there's a lowercase p, it's NAND flash. Oh. Yeah, uppercase okay. p is cross point. Only there were more letters in the alphabet that could have used. <laughs> they didn't to have to. I, I don't, I don't yeah. know why they did it this way. Like Maybe you could call it. O. I guess you can't add an O because then it's seven sixty O, and that's yeah. that's not good, uh, right? Like that would be bad because yeah. you know the O zero come. Uh, I get it. I, I don't like yeah. it, but I get it. Sure, whatever. I think it all started with just like when they did the six hundred P. I think someone just accidentally did a lowercase. No, I don't know. Nothing. I don't, nothing at these companies that was their first happened. The P at the end, I, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think so if anything it was I, the opposite. I don't think their plan was to do it that way initially, and I think they have recently decided to oh, make sure. that change. Oh, sure, no, no. I, I, I think since the release of their first Optane drives, that's what they decided. It, yeah. I don't think that was their plan at the outgate, at the outset either. Uh, so this is, excuse me, an M.2 NVMe drive. Is this the 600P was NVMe as well, right? Yes. Okay, so this is not their first, but this is the first in a while. It's been a, it's been a decent time since the 600P. Uh, 600P was like, I think, a little over a year ago. Oh, okay. Like All right, so reasonable. It was a while. It was around a year ago. Um, the other problem with the 600P was it was it was okay, but it was dog slow. What's that mean? It was really slow. Like, even when you were, it was a caching typical TLC drive with cache. With SLC cache. You know, like what yeah. you kind of expect from a lot of stuff these days. But even the cached speed was only half of what 
this product and like Samsung 960s and stuff were doing. Okay. Right? So it, it was okay, you know, if you were just using a daily, you know, typical well, user kind of stuff, right? But, sure. But the specs were just lower. So like Intel's claims with the 760p here, which was actually surprising. Well, I'm looking at like the specs page or the specs table here, and like yeah. the differences are they go from 32 to 64 layer flash. It's yep. still TLC. Do yep. they, is it still SLC cached? Yes. It is? Okay. Yes. Capacity is up to two terabytes on this one, so that's a doubling of increase. But then like, if you look at the sequential read-write, like that's a huge jump, right? Yeah. You're yeah, going like from compared- 1800 560 up to a 3.2 gigabytes, 1.6 gigabytes. Yeah. And the same result. for the random performance. The random performance almost neatly doubles. Yeah. Above the 600. Is this a new controller too, obviously? Uh yeah, it's a uh, Silicon Motion. I'm trying to remember the number cuz they used a different number for this one because I think this is actually the first appearance uh wow. um of the 2262 from Silicon Motion. I have the data sheet linked in the review oh, okay. for those that are same interested. endurance as well in terms of uh petabytes whatever. Yeah, they they stuck with the same but... endurance numbers. Uh I like that they just Plainly said, you know, so many petabytes per 128 gigabytes of capacity. Because then you could just oh, okay, you could just, do the math yourself. Yeah, it just scales and, linearly. And There's no yeah. silly charts and tables to figure it out, right? right. Um, What's with uh, on this one? So you got three capacities. You got the what'd you get? The 120, 256, 128, 256, 512. Yep. On the bottom there, there's like the place for more packages. Yes. But there are no packages. Correct. Is that just, they mean they're using that same PCB for the one terabyte and two terabyte models, you the, think? They had to use that same PCB for the 512 for a different reason. That's because on the other side of that board, there's two RAM chips on the 512. Oh, okay. Okay. The If you look... But the, but the 128 and 256 do not. Yeah. only have one. And it's hard to see under the labels. And I didn't want to peel all the labels off of these because it affects the thermal performance. And we hadn't finished testing on all of them Got it. when we did the pictures. But if you look at the... You can scroll the top of them. We got another one. Uh, well, yeah, but even that one will work. If you look at the the back edge of the SSD, the last NAND chip mm-hmm. is a little bit like there's more wiggle room on yep. the 128 and 256 <clears throat> versus the 512. So they had to even like space stuff out even further to make room for the sure. you know, the extra RAM chip because the RAM chips on the other two capacities, I believe, are rotated 90 degrees, so it you know gives them a little extra room. Got it. So the whole reason there's pads there on the back of the 512 that are empty is that there are, is a yet-to-be-released one-terabyte and two-terabyte models Okay. of this. Sure. Uh, and it's supposed to be the two-terabyte capacity that requires the double-sided. So sure. they should be able to that go all the, all the way up to one terabyte. They'll just stack more dies within those two flash packages. All right. What performance um, page do I want to look at that, that's going to be interesting here? Uh, just go straight for, like, the uh, mixed burst. Go for that. Boom. Got it. Um... And then uh, look at the numbers. So I, I, I uh, <laughs> hard hitting analysis. Yeah, exactly. I interleaved. Looks great on audio. Uh, in, the, in the results, I interleaved the 760p results with 960 evos of the same capacity. Interleaving the, meaning match capacity. Yeah, I match okay. capacity. You know, it's the evo comes in a 500 versus a 512 for this, but sure. that's, you know, the, the closest um, we can get. So if you look at those read speeds, um, the 512 gig is almost matching a 960 evo. Yeah. Which is impressive. This is a this is a workload that's writes going on in the background, which taxes the caching, mm-hmm. whatever caching is at play, right? And at the same time, it's trying to do relatively large burst reads. In other words, like level loads of a game kind of right, thing, or right. you're launching Office or something like that, right? Uh, the numbers almost match. Yeah. For you know, you're within a few percent. <clears throat> the of a 256 model, the 760p is definitely a little bit lower. Yep. And then the, the 250. And then if you go the next rung down, now it starts getting painful. If you go to the 120, no, no, the, like the 128. Oh, 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 sure, sure, sure. Yeah, the 128 oh, yes. capacity. I got it. Yeah. Uh, that's where it's like I'm not sure if I would really recommend that one. Mm-hmm. Right. But yeah, but but if you look at the 600p, tick the bottom, the second for the bottom, the 600p at 512 gigs yes. compared to the 512 gig 760p, you yes. see where those specification differences are coming into play. Oh, yeah. In terms of actual yeah, it's, performance. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very large difference. Um, and then if you go to that uh, read service time, which is, I think, the next chart, next chart down, Ryan. Oh, sorry. Next chart down. Yeah, so that's where we're just totaling Thank up. Thank you. What's the total amount of time it took to read that four gig worth of data spread out throughout the test? Mm-hmm. So this is just this is your kind of stopwatch time, right? This is your you're sitting there waiting for the computer to finish a thing, kind of time. Uh, six seconds versus five point seven seconds for the nine sixty Evo, so like 0.3 seconds slower. You know, doing four gig worth of 
worth of reads. Right. That's not a lot of time. Like you're getting, you know, you're sort of getting to the point where you can't really go much faster with the drive. It's diminishing returns, right, on how much time you're actually saving because the time gets to be so small, mm -hmm. right? Um, what's comical there is look at the SSD 750. Uh, which is third from the bottom there. And there was a point where that was like the fastest NVMe drive we had. That right? was the big... Was like, it the first NVMe drive? From Intel. From Intel? Yeah. And it was based on enterprise technology. They right. just kind of ported it over and made a client version. And uh, that thing doesn't do well with reads, especially while there's writes going on. Um, you know, so like the time for that 19.7 seconds versus six seconds yeah. for the 760p. Yeah. And that other thing is a half height, half length... Thing. You can't put it in a laptop like it's right, right. Or, or it just it just in general takes up an add-in card slot, whereas yeah. this this does not. Yeah. So what what about so uh, pricing uh -huh. wise? Yep. So I would say you know you list the pros cons here. The con I think of the 128 gig makes sense. Its performance was kind of significantly lower than the other options. Yeah. And it's really down to just the 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 speed of Intel's flash, like a di a given die of Intel's flash, still yeah. hasn't caught up to Samsung. As far right. as the speed, right? Okay. So if you go all the way down to 128 gig, it's not the controller's fault that the drive's slow. It's just that there's not enough flash. For it to address... It's the flash is going... The, the flash is the bottleneck, okay. right? Um, which is, you know, just a data point. Take note of that. Also, keep in mind, Samsung doesn't make a 120 gig, you know, 960 Evo. They probably do it for a reason. Probably because that's the point where oh. you would yeah, start okay. to notice I a decrease. They okay. right. No, they, they don't. You're um, right. No, you're right. Okay. And they don't make a pro below... 512? Uh, no, I think they make 256. Oh, okay. Yeah, but they don't go lower than that, right? They're not doing a 128. Right. So Intel's trying to go for the super, you know, I mean, budget they're value. Offering the, the MSRP is 74 bucks. Yes. Right? For yeah. the 128 gig model. So you're getting a huge performance hit, and you're paying more cost per gig, but like, hey, it's, it is $75, which yeah, is, is kind of nice. That's pretty cheap overall However, for an NVMe However, that being thing. said, with the 256 gig at 109, it's not that much more. It's not that much more. Yeah. You're getting significantly better performance and significantly lower cost per gig right. as well. Yeah, that's another thing that's that's noticeable here is that Intel's, usually the cost per gig lately on SSDs has been roughly linear, Yeah. right? These are not. Mm. So Intel tends to be more, um, they will take into account the cost of the controller, the cost of the build of the product, the cost of the RAM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? They take that more into account at the lower capacities where the cost per gig ends up you know, not being the same at the lowest capacity right. as it is at the highest, right? So there's an obvious fall off there. You know, it's, um, the, I mean, the comparison here is pretty interesting because at you know just under forty cents a gig, the five yeah. twelve gig version of the of the of the, the new SSD seven sixty p is quite a bit lower. I mean, it, it's six cents, right? So you're looking at forty six cents for the five hundred or five hundred gig nine sixty Evo. Yes, but if you go by street pricing, that's thirty dollar price difference right now. Would you still consider the 960 Evo to be faster than the 760p? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. It is the faster drive. Yeah. But the 760p is like right on its tail. Yeah. It's How much like, faster? Well, and we've gone in this debate a lot of times too about Pro versus Evo. Evo has some advantages in some cases because of that SLC cache. Yes. The Pro doesn't have. Pro is better at sustained. Right. Um, but not as crucial of a of a data point for typical consumer. Workloads. Right, right, right. I would be hard pressed if you were comparing the two 500, the 512 gig 760p to the 500 gig 960 Evo. Yeah. I'd be hard pressed for even a power user to be able to tell the difference between the two. If right. they were just sitting at a computer, A versus B, blind test, whatever. The performance results from our test suite are just so close to each other. It would be, I, I probably couldn't even tell. If I was maybe even stopwatch timing it, I probably still wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah. Um, so the fact that in the higher capacities, at least, it's able to come close enough to almost consider matching a 960 Evo when it's doing it at a lower cost. That's good, right? Like, and the warranty is five years, and I'd have to double check this, but I thought like the, I thought the 960 Pro had five year warranty, and the 960 Evo had a three year warranty, right? Which means that this has two more years of a warranty over the Evo, and is still cheaper, and is almost the same performance. It, it, I, yeah, I, I still think. A lot of people will see the performance delta to the Evo and, and go that route, which is fine. Yeah. Um, and Samsung just has a, a really good name in the consumer space for for the solid state. Yep, yep. But for Intel, it's a pretty big jump from the 600p to the 760p is, in terms of making a competitive product in the yeah, area. Yeah, because the 600p right. was just not competitive. Yeah. Right. And and what what they needed was a good, solid, competitive M.2 part to be able to sell people. Right. right? Um, 
If I was uh, if I was going for like a 250 or a 256, I would probably choose the 960 no matter what, just because that's where you start to right. notice a fall off. And then 128, well, the only one you can really get, unless you want to go for the really budget, because uh, there are other SSDs that are only PCIe by two that come in 128 gig capacities. So like there's Fizon ones out there and stuff like that. We're actually going to do a, a my digital discount makes the my digital SSD like the there's an X, SBX they just launched. That goes all the way down to 128 gig. That would be an interesting thing to compare versus this one because that that part is actually like another five or ten bucks cheaper than the 74 bucks. It's like 65 yeah. bucks or something for 128. All right. Um, so that'll be coming up, you know, later this week probably. All right. Uh, but for now, I mean, you know, it's it's a good drive. Looks like a good drive. Performs well. More options out there. Lower prices across the board. We Fantastic. want more competition, right? Yeah. If, if anything, if the if this product launch did nothing except for force Samsung to drop the price of the 960 Evo a little bit more, that, that'd be great. People win. Right? Yeah. Just want, we just want these things cheaper. Uh, before we move on to the next story, I did ha- we did have some new patrons. Let's see. Scott Maloney pledged $10. New patron. Thank you very much, Scott. That kicks ass. And then uh, Daniel Padilla edited their pledge from $3 up to $5. So thank you guys very much. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. I don't think I mentioned... During that part of the show at the beginning, that if you become a new patron or in- increase your patronage, we'll give you a shout out when we record the show. So thank you guys very much for that. This is wunderbar, yeah. Uh, yes. This is good. This is very good. Translated that for you. Yeah, well. Uh, real quick, point you guys to review that Lee posted of the EVGA uh, Supernova 750 watt G3 power supply. EVGA, I, I, I will openly admit has done an excellent job becoming a powerful force in the power supply market, right? They have all the right channel stuff in place. They have all the right, um, they have the right kind of enthusiast consumer mind space. Uh, and in general, the power supplies that Lee has reviewed uh, have been incredibly well received. Um, this one kind of being no different. Fully modular power supply, uh, 750 watt, obviously, but it has different capacities going uh, or available as well. Uh, uh, fan that stops spinning when you don't need it. Um, I'll skip to the end of this one here. If if you guys care about power supplies, and really you should if you're building a PC, uh, Lee's reviews, in my humble opinion, are unmatched in, in, the, in the world there. Plus, anytime you can see a layout of all the different cable connection cap- capabilities... That's really what I'm after. I'm more impressed with his test setup because he has it's some so serious cool. he has some serious power testing gear to I, be able to test powers you know 1500 watt power supplies to the limit <laughs> and actually accurately measure yeah their efficiency and that's everything. That's actually one of the ideas I had is to sometime this spring bring him back in with all that test gear. Um, it's going to need and, to rent a truck. Do another video where we describe the testing methodology and why it's important and, and that yeah, stuff because he's that be good. Because not only is he really good at it, but he's very very good at explaining it to people like me. Yeah. Would need that. I uh, did get an editor's choice, like I said, 750 watts, 80 plus gold certified. So not the peak efficiency capability, but that does keep the price lower. Um, and uh, I agree with him in that what we would like to see in terms of a weakness is dedicated cables for the six PCIe connectors as opposed to the splits. But the splits are, I think, are, are pretty common these days. And the 750 watt version is 129 bucks. So actually pretty impressively priced overall. And you can get the 1,000 watt up to uh, $200 as well. So check that out if you can. Uh, I don't know. Wh- Tim posted this story right before we came in, before we started, mm-hmm. about Samsung introducing Xenand-based 800 gigabyte Z SSD for the Enterprise HPC. I think we've talked about this technology a little bit. We talked about it. This would be the second generation Xenand. No. It's not. It's still on the first this, generation? This is the, the shipping announcement of the first product oh, This is the productization I, I think, of the first generation. I think tech. last time we talked about this SSD with the specs, it was a leak-ish sort of like okay. white paper spec page on their site. It came out not. around the same time as Flash Memory Summit. Yeah. Um, this is still first gen, though. I'm really surprised they're taking I, so I, long I, on the first sure gen. This is Samsung saying, hey, we're shipping this now. Yeah. Not that you can go well, that's buy nice. it. Nobody's reviewed it still. Like... Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I don't understand. <clears throat> I mean, this is clearly an enterprise only play, right? Like, this oh, yeah. is not even, you know, when, when, like, when the 900P came out, it was kind of like, hey, it's enthusiasts, but it's really kind of workstation yes. and above, right? Yes. 
Uh, this one is th- not that. It's enterprise only. Right. They're, they're, you probably won't be able to, well, I don't want to say won't this be able to. This is P4800X, basically. Uh, uh, equivalent markets. That's what they're Got going it. for. Got it. But the catch is they're doing it with NAND. Which I still think is confusing, but also impressive. Yes. That they can meet the latency uh, claims that they have put forth. Well, the latency claims, keep in mind, they're not trying to claim the same latency as Crosspoint is capable of. But right. it's it's closer to those numbers than it is to the numbers of normal NAND. Right. Right. Which is very impressive that they're able to do that. It so, should be much cheaper. Yeah. Well, we have pricing. It's not, well, it's cheaper than Crosspoint, but the problem is that for if it's first gen, it's SLC. Yeah. So this is, this says that, uh, uh, I just lost the, between 12 and 20 microseconds is what the rated read latencies are. Yeah, it's pretty good. Which is pretty good. What, what would be like a traditional NVMe SSD? Uh, nowadays around 60 or 70. Okay. And then uh, cross points cross point, like seven. It's rated at, well, seven. The seven to 10. 4800X is just less than 10. <laughs> okay. Uh, some of the smaller, like the Optane memory stuff. Yep. That's rated at like seven. Stuff like that. Okay. Right. Um, Did they mention price in here at all, Ken? Does, does no, I, I haven't seen a price. Yeah, I don't think anybody's really seen pricing <laughs> anywhere. But the problem is it's it's SLC. Right, we have we're, we're in a world now where most of the stuff is TLC, and that's where your cost per gig and all that stuff is centered around. And now yeah. this is a SLC of like 800 gig. That's so. Your guess is that it's not going to be significantly less expensive than well, take the, your the cross point. Take stuff. take your you know how much uh, SLC flash would you need to make an 800 gig SSD? Uh, like just say using regular VNAND, mm-hmm. right? And then probably double that number, yeah, or something yeah. on top of that because. They obviously had to change something in it architecturally in order to be able to make it go that quickly. I would, yeah. Right. Um, and they just haven't given us a whole lot of detail on what that is yet. They right? haven't. Uh, they, at Flash Memory Summit last year, uh, they talked about how they were already on second generation. Well, they were developing second generation. Well, they already had claims of performance. Oh, okay. Right. right? And, they, and the idea was that the latency was actually a little bit longer per request mm-hmm. because it was MLC. And also because it's MLC. But the price could come down. It basically halves the price of the media. Okay. When you go from SLC to MLC, right? Um, Which is great. It's interesting to think about a second generation of a product being slower, purposefully, but to reduce cost. And then... And it not be like a subset brand or something like that. Right. And then they all... And then it was even stranger that they announced that, but they hadn't even been shipping the first generation one yet. It's like, here's the next one and it's going to be slower, but cheaper. Right. Slower but cheaper. Yeah. In, in some cases, that's fine. Uh, so, you know, rated at 750,000 IOPS read performance, uh, 170,000 random write performance, maxing out the buy four interface at 3.2 gigabytes per second for both re- reads and writes. Um, Notice that the writes are significantly lower IOPS than the reads there. So they probably had to rob Peter to pay Paul slightly on this architecture thing. Like you can accelerate the reads much faster, but they have to do some extra work Got on, it. on the back end on the rights. Got it. Um, you know, but again, that's just speculation based on me just looking at the specs. And Tim thinks that we'll see some more information uh, released about ZSSDs at the Xenand Flash Technology uh, or and the Xenand Flash Technology at the ISSCC conference in mid February. My personal favorite conference, yeah. the International Solid State Circuits Conference. Always the best. If you're an electronic geek, there's usually some amazing uh, slides that come out of that event. That's where everybody, you wouldn't think so. You'd think everybody would be all trade secrety, generally speaking, right. in the industry. That's the one place where everybody just like shows off all their stuff. They present on like, here's our next generation, whatever. There'll yeah. probably be some. Gen- some That's like I- Intel was talking EMIB, I think. Oh, really? Uh, okay. Last year, I guess, for FPGA stuff. Yeah. Huh. When I was doing my research for like trying to figure out how Crosspoint actually worked, and I wrote mm-hmm. that article on it, like the the best material I got came from, came from ISSCC, and it w- it came from them like a decade ago. When they were theoretically talking yeah. about what could be yeah, possible, yeah, it was only yeah. when oh, or this thing might be a thing someday. Here you go, guys. It looks like it's cool, huh? You know, and, and then, then suddenly all the information disappeared, and they true. stopped talking about it. When they thought, <laughs> hey, we can turn this into money, as it that's, turns that's out, that's true. As soon as, it, so. as soon as it became a thing that could have happened, yeah, there you go. All right, let's. Uh, you can see on the rundown, boys. It's time to talk money with Josh Walrath. <laughs> we like money. Ka-ching, ka-ching. Uh, we're gonna start with Western Digital. 
uh, announcing their second quarter financial results. Tim actually wrote this up. Oh, I've got nothing to do with that. No, no, that's fine. That's why our drives are for plebs. <laughs> I mean, look at that guy to your right. He looks pleb. Need I say more? Looks very pleb. Uh, <clears throat> San Jose-based storage company reported revenue of five point three billion, with an operating income of nine hundred fifty-five million. Um, we lost our desktop. Oh, oh, what? Huh? Came. Oh, yeah, you did. <sighs> yep. Came back last time. <laughs> We're way better than looking at a previous story. That's not true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. We're good again. Okay. Hey. There we go. So apparently they made some money. Uh, let's see. Operating income increased 72% over the same quarter last year, uh, up 3% over the previous quarter. I don't understand the markets that well because, of course, after this news of positive earnings growth, uh, their stock went down. Whatever. A lot of other stuff goes into it. 72% increase and their stock went down? Year over year. Yeah. Yeah. Operating income year over year. Um, so And there was that whole that. Toshiba thing. Uh, which which part of the Toshiba thing? Oh, well, the, apparently they've made nice now um, as part of this. But there was the whole oh yeah, well that's true memory they, collaboration thing, which I, I'm pretty sure didn't. Oh right, because they were trying to sell like to, didn't Western Digital have some kind of stake in that? And they well they do because yeah. they're using the the Bix uh, Toshiba flash. Oh right, that's yep. what's in Washington Digital's SSD. I got it. I yeah. got it. So I have a feeling they had a lot of expenses this year that aren't normal. Yeah, like legal expenses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Well, there you go. Uh, earning season continues. We'll talk about Intel's results next. Um, Josh gets to use his favorite image ever created for the website, which is the Scrooge I know, McDuck. I didn't even create it myself. I think you did. Uh, no, I don't have that much creativity uh, no, in that, me that at came all. From somewhere. Was that Scott? We lose it again, Alex. No. I don't, I don't yep. know what to tell you. He's not touching anything. Yeah, it's just being dumb. Well, Q4 2017 results, Josh. What happened to Intel this time? You know, Intel had a slightly stronger quarter than people were expecting. Uh, you know, as as we have discussed seemingly ad nauseum for the last five years, the PC market is not dead. It continues to just chug along. Yeah, it doesn't grow like it used to. However, it's not shrinking either, even in the face of, of mobile computing and uh, extreme mobile computing in, in the form of, you know, cell phones right. and whatnot. People still want to work on either laptops or desktops that have screen space. They have a big mouse and keyboard. They've, they've got possibly good graphics card and sound and, and things that they enjoy to do and watch movies on and something that's not five and a half inches wide. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I like how you could see the reflection of Josh's Google search for orange backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't actually pull that. up one. It's just Google image salt. <laughs> that gets him that gets him a very diverse Open orange paint. tone. It's it's kind of stochastic in the way it, it, it does the light. And so right. it, it's kind I of found randomized. It works better yeah. than just a solid orange Josh, of that I think color. That's, so. I think that strategy works. The, the, yeah. the pressing thing is he's actually searching for orange backside. Not backside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm, uh. Mm. Oh, and now he's Lord. red and there's nothing that orange background can do about it at that part no true. it, it can't <laughs> yeah. so anyway uh you know they would have made money in terms of uh you know net income however they 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 paid a rather significant tax bill and so they're actually lost money this quarter at around uh what 670 million dollars but it's not 687 million but that's not kind of a big deal because, one, they've got a lot of cash. Uh, and, two, this next year uh, with this tax cut, now that, that $687 billion, million was due to the way the tax <laughs> bill is structured. And so they had to pay that out this past quarter. But this next year, assuming nothing changes in, in terms of the law, um, they're expecting another 10% increase in money sent to dividends per quarter. So they're kind of paying their shareholders. Now, uh, I know a lot of people would probably say, you know, why aren't you paying your lowest level people more money? Well, if you look at Intel, I think they pay everybody pretty damn well, no matter if you're 
cleaning toilets, you're a full-time job with full benefits and a lot of money because working in San Jose and Santa Clara, it's not cheap. It's not, not cheap to live a there cheap place as it turns and out. So yeah, but so they're, they're, you know, they're, they're giving that to their shareholders and, and in turn, this is money that people, I mean, where, where are your guys' 401ks? I mean, if you have one, invest in typically the stock market, blue chips. Sure, sure, sure. Stuff from like Intel. And so they're actually spreading that money around a lot more than you would expect. So anyway, um, they had a good quarter, but not everything is shiny. And it's primarily because Spectre Meltdown. Um, yeah. All of their stuff is affected a stage more than what AMD, ARM, and other CPU guys um, are at this time. And so they've got a lot more work to do to kind of plug these holes. And they've got software fixes. They've got firmware fixes. And these are things that, for the average user, is not a big deal. I mean, maybe 5 to 10% in some things, uh, 0% decrease in performance for you know some very very basic things you really wouldn't notice but you know the data center guys that are running the uh the back ends of like mmos and stuff they're seeing a 20 to 30 percent increase in cpu time right yep it's a uh, random reads random reads the cpu time takes a hit the performance not so much, but they're just more processing power to do the random reads. And then for random yeah, reads, so your 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 power is increasing. Yep. Your cooling costs for, are increasing uh, you do, in AWS these major data going centers. Up every month. Yeah, for random writes, it flips around the other way. The CPU load increase is not so bad, but the performance drops by like ten or twenty percent on random writes, which is not a client heavy thing, right? Client isn't usually just, right. you know, your regular PC users are doing random writes all day. So but. what was their, what, I mean, their guidance in that was, you know, we have the quote here in your story where it's like. We've got two different quotes. One from Please. the CFO said, we see no meaningful impact on corporate earnings, right? right. That's, that's pretty basic. And then they have the typical writer. We have and may continue to face product claims, litigation, and adverse publicity and consumer relations from security vulnerabilities and or mitigation techniques, including as a result of side channel exploits such as Spectre and MechDom, which can adversely impact our results of operations, customer <laughs> relationships, and reputation. Separately, the publicity around recent disclosed security vulnerabilities may result in increased attempts by third parties to identify additional vulnerabilities and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's it interesting. sounds like the Micro Machines guy is supposed to come on to it's read It's interesting that. to me that, that well... It's it's almost like a pharmaceutical product. Yeah. That's true. This pill may cure you, but it may also cause death. But if you've ever if you've ever looked at like a presentation of uh uh like uh, a quarterly earnings presentation, mm -hmm. that first slide of disclaimers, blah blah blah, whatever, yeah. is literally the tiniest font that you could possibly fit, and it's full and it's packed full, and it's all full of lines like that. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> or at least and that's going to be think, added to it now. <laughs> I think what, what I would take away from it is more the CFO's statements because that's probably more realistic to what they're actually seeing happen in real time. Sure. And the statement instead that, you know, that Josh just was attempting to read through is more of the, <clears throat> you know, head counsel from Intel said, you guys should probably put this in your thing. This is we the safe kind thing of cover to do. your ass a bit. But it's, but it's also yeah. interesting yeah. that they're not even, they're not just talking about performance degradation potential, right? They're talking about like, hey, customer Litigation. relationships, reputation, and the fact that um, these vulnerabilities may actually bring in other people trying to find vulnerabilities. It's true. Right. Which is just an interesting thing to have to report in a financial document. Right. Like, as it turns out, people may use this and find more crap that's wrong. Um, that Epic works or that Epic servers looking pretty good these that's days. That's right. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, in terms of um, the specific markets, I don't, uh, <clears throat> the consumer market, what did it, did it go down? The consumer market dropped by about 2%, okay. which you can kind of see because. They've got another competitor here, right? That's actually shipping products that has a lot of excitement, and yep. so yeah, you can understand their consumer stuff going down because there's increased competition from AMD. And yes, I mean you know PCs are not again, it's it's PCs are not growing, they're not really shrinking, and so that change of market share has to come from somewhere. And then and this is. 
kind of what we've we've seen so far. The biggest growth was in that data center group. Twenty percent is a surprisingly high number, actually. Over a year, yeah. It's, it, it's especially considering you know I think many of us thought like, hey, Epic was released by AMD, it would have some more substantial impact. Clearly, the refresh cycles ramp up of that is, is taking a bit longer. We'll mention that when we talk about the AMD results in the next story. Um, but didn't well, I think the, we I had, think the bigger part of that is you know, people kind of assume, hey, you know, we've got these cell phones that can do so much, and we've got these, you know, desktop computers can do so much. What more do we really need from the cloud? And the people who are creating applications are saying, you know, I could I could do a lot more stuff if you give me the horsepower. I mean, yeah. you know, five years ago, would you get real-time, uh, you know, traffic situations around the United States? I mean, you look up the, the Google Maps things like show me the traffic in Dallas, Texas, and we'll show you the major, you know, I mean, that that's all not only data, but a lot of computation going on to figure out all of these different points like, hey, you know, we've got all these signals from cell phones and people, you know, accessing maps and how far did they move in five minutes? And it's just an insane amount of data. And that requires a lot of computational resources to to interpret that and do something that, you know, I can look at my phone as like, hey, I don't want to take that road yeah, 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 yeah. because it's yeah. red. Yes. And and these guys, I mean, and that's just, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg. I mean, people I, are I think I think what you're trying to say is there's a huge amount of growth in cloud compute. So even if AMD was gaining share, there was still room for Intel to grow because mm-hmm. of these expanding opportunities. Correct. Yeah. Um, yes, I agree. So uh, the, only, the only other thing that I wanted to mention from the Intel earnings is that they uh, surprisingly said that there would be new silicon coming later this year yeah. that would address Spectre Meltdown vulnerabilities. Now, they didn't say specifically that it would make the chips safer or if it would make the chips uh, slower, more like faster with the patches or something mm, like that, yeah. right? So they didn't really go into that much detail. But are you surprised at all that they would be able to do something uh, in the span of a calendar year and get it out to market? Possibly because if if they could do kind of make the cash more private, yeah. say namely, okay, so speculative execution, it can read these cash lines. And it can also read some other cache lines. And because it, it's all in the same kind of administrative level, I guess. You know, what's the, what's the you know, uh, permission type level? Rings? Um, AMD does not have that problem because it's a little bit more encapsulated. It's like, hey, speculative execution can, can write and read to these cache lines, but it can't do anything for anybody else around it. But Intel's a little bit more wide open. And so that's a change that they could do kind of at the front end that could possibly mitigate a lot of this, you know, the the Spectre variant one. Yep. Or spe- uh, variant two, two, you know. And uh, I think, uh, what is that, uh, Thor Hammer or what was that other exploit? Where Thor-hammer. they did Thor-hammer. all kinds of cache line writes and they yeah, could uh, actually yeah, that's figure Thor-hammer. out what's in the next cache line over. I mean, yep. there's there's some things that you just can't do because there's physicalities of the chip and right. if you read some of the physicalities then it doesn't matter what permissions and, and whatnot you have but um, yeah they could do that and it would be a smaller type of uh, change as compared to you know redesigning the entire front end yeah I think it'll be interesting to see what happens and clearly this is a story we'll be following for. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, just a, the one last thing to say is, okay. is even though the CFO said, you know, we, we don't see any huge thing. We don't know. We don't know how it is going to affect. We don't know how sure. these third party guys are going to come around and said, you know what? Epic's out. It's got really good performance. There are a couple of features in there that I can buy at a lower level that Intel only offers at a higher level. And plus, they're a little bit more robust when it comes to some of these security things. Maybe I'll start turning, you know, our qualifications towards them. Yeah. And we don't know how many people are going to do that. We don't know how many are going to think that way. Uh, yeah. When you consider also price and performance, AMD again has advantage because they're willing to to do lower cost parts 
at any certain level than what Intel has, though. We'll see how Intel responds. I mean, it's going to be a really interesting next nine months because typically two to three quarters is when we see uh, big shifts in enterprise. If they decide to go in a different direction because they got to qualify stuff, got to make sure it all works with their software. And uh, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see if AMD can grow Epic at the rate that they're hoping to. So let's talk about let's talk about the AMD earnings real quick then. Um, sure. The 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 to me the story here is uh, they returned to profitability for the year. They had a, what was a twenty five percent increase or thirty five percent increase in just quarterly like year over year revenue or quarter uh, was it sequential or qu- year over year, year over year year over year revenue. So Q four twenty sixteen to Q four yeah twenty seventeen yeah. Um, it was significant. The biggest number that stood out to me is the 60% increase in compute and graphics, which covers Ryzen, mm-hmm. you know, Threadripper as well, still a Ryzen brand, and graphics. Yep. So they saw a 60% increase there, which I believe was equated to $140 million of additional revenue in that group. Is that right, Josh? Yeah, around there, yeah. Uh, I talked to somebody today uh, from AMD, and they said – well, and Lisa said in her statement, I think that approximately a third of that was into crypto, crypto blockchain sales, like mm-hmm. like stuff that they have been able to, you know, I, I don't think they can say for 100 percent, but with a reasonable assurance, otherwise they wouldn't say it in a public, you know, financial forum yeah. like this. That a third of that. So about forty six million dollars of GPU sales going directly to cryptocurrency over okay. the last quarter. So they just. Kind of roughly gauged how much of their product. Well, was I mean, going they to. have a lot more information than we do in terms of what their customers are selling to, yeah. and you know, they can quest a lot more information, and they're working with a lot of different people. And that is probably still not perfect. Nobody has figured out a way to really judge what portion of GPU sales are going for gaming, which portion are not. But regardless, I think it's important to point out that that's a significant part of your revenue. Yeah, right. To, to keep track of, and not only that, but but the. The two Polaris chips that they're just selling out of, mm-hmm. they're relatively small and easy to manufacture, and they utilized just regular GDDR. Yeah. Well, they're not the Vega <laughs> with the HBM2 memory. Right. Which I mean, means they're the cheaper to make, and stuff, they should be making more profit. Mm, yeah. Maybe. I guess it all depends on no, what they end I, up I selling don't think them Vega for, is making more profit. I think I think their bread and butter is is Polaris, and they're they're selling. The RX 570s, 580s, yeah. 560s. One, one of the interesting things that she also said was that I think somebody asked her what the response was going to be. And she she made the statement that they were going to ramp up production. And uh, that's always been a debate in the in amongst enthusiasts and stuff like, hey, why not just make more chips? Mm-hmm. Why not just make more graphics cards? And there's a lot of like financial risk involved in that. If you start to increase, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a delay, there's a lag between when you place that order and when cards show up on a shelf. And all that time in between is a huge risk of the markets shifting dramatically. Or evaporating down to nothing. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> cryptocurrency, very fluid, uh, very volatile. So it's hard to, to put a whole lot of weight in that. You benefit as much as you can yeah. as a company, but there's, it's hard to put a whole lot of weight in it. But it's also... Yeah, I mean, there, there are two limiting factors there, too. Okay. One on. is AMD could sell as many cards and chips as they want to their partners, except... Their partners have two things to worry about. One, it's their inventory that could really be impacted. And two, memory costs. Memory costs right now are across the board just nuts. Yeah, and, and so availability they are taking not, not a just, lot of risk. Not just cost, so but, I think, but memory. I think AMD, if they wanted to, they could ramp up silicon production as much as they want. I mean, until a point where their partners just say, hey, we can't buy anymore because we're too scared. Yeah. So it's it's not really a ramping issue. It's it's there's I mean, we've already seen one bubble some years back where there was just a ton of not only new inventory that was just sitting around, but also a lot of miners getting rid of inexpensive, cheap used video cards that you may Get a couple of years out of it, it may burn out quickly because it's been run twenty four seven for a year. Yeah, I, uh, apparently it, Lisa made some statement. I don't know if it was during the call or an ancillary thing later in the day that they are memory supply bound on both HBM and 
GDDR5. Yes. So that's as a, much as they can ramp up capacity, chips, but. it's 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 the bit density of the market as a whole that is the problem. The same thing that is making system like RAM prices skyrocket, yeah, is the concern over uh, what GPUs can make. And AMD claims that it's affecting HBM and GDDR5 because um, at the end of the day they're all made by the same people, uh, and, and thus it's not really AMD's final decision. And it may be a happy accident for them that that's the case because now they don't, they don't have the pressure on them to do this and they can maybe take the safer stance of, eh, we'll increase it as much as we can, but not really going all out. Like we're not going to suddenly start because what you could do is you could say, I don't care. I can sell everything I make. I'm going to will, I'm going to be willing to market a new version of the RX 580 called the RX 680 mining edition. It's going to be $600 right. and you eat the cost of, of buying that memory away from other people. But then you set yourself up for a huge disaster in the future, potentially. What else in the AMD side, like on the CPU sections, like the server group was, you know, up 3% year over year, but not so like not a huge increase. We kind well, of talked I mean, about that previously. They're still ramping up Epic. I mean, it yeah. was released this past summer, but again, it takes about three quarters for anything to really happen in terms of that business because you've got HP and Dell and Supermicro and these guys, they've got to take – the chips, they got to take the platforms and they got to make sure that they just hammer them and make them work. And then they have the application guys come in and start testing out different, uh, you know, the different popular data, you know, big data type uh, apps that 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 they will be working on. Make sure everything works as possible. And I mean, just the verification, certification of these parts takes ages and they are ramping up, and I believe that Lisa said, you know, throughout November, December, they actually saw quite a few more shipments and and really pushing uh, inventory out the door. HP's got one product out. D Dell's uh, almost got another. Yeah, they're working with several other top tier OEMs uh, that will have Epic products out. But it's just it's just going to take time. The interest is there, and especially with Meltdown Spectre. Uh, there's well, a little the bit Intel more. Management engine. There's a little Don't bit more. Don't forget about momentum. that huge Intel management engine issue. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> the branding rights itself. It, I mean, not inside. Well, I'll buy that. Yeah. yeah. And so they, uh, you know, they're, they're going to be ramping that up, and that's going to be taking a lot of the slack from the semi-custom guys because the last two years we've seen multiple chips uh, being designed, and then. Uh, uh, produced for the first time, so it started with what the Xbox One S, and then the PS4 Pro, and then finally the Xbox One X. Mm -hmm. And so for the past three years, AMD has been really busy with these new parts. And for the couple of years before that, were the original Xbox One and the PS4. And so they're kind of expecting a downward slide in in new products there especially from the consoles. We're going to wait a few years until we see anything new from both Sony and Microsoft. Uh, but the other area of semi-custom that's interesting is, of course, the Intel Cabby Lake G, which utilizes Vega graphics. And we found out uh, for pretty much the first time that I think that AMD actually came out and said it, the chips that they are making for that, I mean, they produce themselves and they sell direct to Intel. So this is not... Hey, we're going to develop this. You kind of pay for development, and then you give us royalties for everything you create. No, it's it's. I'm pretty sure they've said that before. Sales. What? I'm pretty sure they said that before that Intel was buying the product from AMD. They uh, were. They were not real specific. This was really seriously the first time that they had said we're selling them these chips on an individual basis. So. Even though this product may not be the best-selling Intel product ever, it's several million chips that AMD would not sell yeah. regardless. And so it's it's a big kick in the pants. It could lead to further collaborations throughout the next couple of years until Raja gets Intel up to speed, which is going to be three to four years from now, to have a solid graphics architecture that is going to be competitive with what AMD and NVIDIA has. So they've got some time to, to make some money off the back of their main competition, which is which is a big positive for them. 
Um, they also talked about how this next quarter is going to be even bigger than the last. Now, Q1 is usually a slower quarter than Q4. Q4 is the money maker. It's the holiday season. It's mm-hmm. where people buy the most stuff. And then it's the hangover in Q1 where nobody wants to buy anything unless they absolutely have to. Uh, they made $1.48 million, I think, this last quarter. They're expecting $1.55 billion. I'm sorry. Yeah, B, billion B, dollars. Yeah. Big B. And that's just a jump that you never really see in this industry. And so uh, they've got the, the Ryzen with Vega graphics coming out. They're, they've already released the uh, the mobile part of this. They're going, re- going to be re- releasing the desktop part. And uh, then looking ahead in Q2, we've got the Zen Plus made on 12 nanometer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And if you look through the rest of the year, they've probably got uh, some other surprises for us. Maybe, hopefully, some other graphic stuff because... Right now, Vega is just, I mean, people want it, but it's hot and it's expensive. Yeah, I mean, look, they're selling everything they can make. So at this point, it's hard for them to complain about any of that. Yeah. But understood. Yeah. yeah. Andy, so it was a Andy really good quarter well. for them. It was a fantastic year. Yeah. And uh, Ryzen has been a, a huge lifesaver for the company. Agreed. All right, let's let's uh, let's run through some other stories here. SK Hynix launches its 8 gigabit GDDR6 memory running at 14 gigabits per second. So this is what we expect we'll see on uh, next generation graphics cards from AMD and NVIDIA, probably. Um, Looks like they have a 12 gigabit and a 14 gigabit version of it, uh, depending on different voltages and power consumption. I actually, you know, had an interesting discussion about implications of GDDR6 for... Uh, non-graphics integration as well, networking, yep. automotive, that type of stuff that, that we'll dive into at a different time. Um, and you can see in this table that Tim put together of theoretical memory bandwidth uh, that at 14 gigabits per second at a 256 mem- 256-bit memory bus, we're at 448 gigabytes per second, which is uh, that's about on par with a Vega 64, I think. Right, like a Vega sixty four, you know, this, Vega sixty four is not much more than five hundred gigs. I think it's, I think it might be under five hundred gigs per second because this right I here, this so. this two hundred fifty six is per chip, right? So uh, Vega sixty four is two packages, so you know, there you go. And I think it's it's running at a lower frequency than that. So yeah, you know, power draw and board space are are obviously still advantages that HBM will have over any of the GDDR stuff. Uh, but in terms of performance, it's up there, right? And if you go, if you expand that out to 384 bit bus, you know, you're up to 768 or 864 gigabytes per second, depending on on the speed. So it's it's pretty impressive. Coming to a video card near you soon, uh, Jeremy. Oh, I won't be able to buy a video card soon. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I didn't say you'd be able to buy it, but it might come to a video card soon. No, Stare it'll just behind the glass GDR6, case at the world's for a best while. mining memory. Hey. <laughs> that, that'd be the tagline I'd come up with. Uh, Epic Can Games. we have a little extra latency just to piss them off? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy, tell me about Epic's, Epic Games shutting down Paragon. But uh, hey, you know, they're refunding your money some, right? So that's well, that, nice. that's the nice part about it. I mean, because I honestly don't even know what a Paragon is. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> that's it, a bad it came thing out for sort them. Of Early access. I don't know that it was actually fully, properly, completely released. And obviously, now it won't. Uh, but sort of anyone who paid for uh, the early access or just anything in any sort of purchase for it, because I'm sure that there's hats and stuff, as there usually is in MOBAs, you're going to get every single cent back, which is nice. I guess it also proves that people aren't really into third-person style MOBAs. They like the top-down ones. I, I will admit I never played Paragon. I Go- mean, it was supposed to be like a uh, Overwatch-style game, I believe, right? Yeah. Was never yeah, I think it was like a bastard child between Dota and Overwatch. Yeah. I Yeah, I, 
I gotta admit I didn't play this one. No, no one did. I guess that's why they're closing it down and giving refunds. Yeah. <sighs> hey, but good on Epic for taking the right measurement there and uh, absolutely and doing the refunds. Uh, what about this one? Microsoft may be looking to buy EA or Valve or PUBG. This is probably fine. They make up their mind, right? First of all, it's totally fine. All it turns out they have a console that they need some games for. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Well, so, it, it, go ahead, Jeremy. So Phil Spencer, um, who really pushed uh, the development of Xbox One and the Microsoft Store as as it goes towards gaming, sort of got a bit of a, a bump up, but he's an executive VP now. And Microsoft has been talking a lot about trying to become a gaming boutique store. Uh, and for anyone who's visited the Microsoft store, I'll wait for you to stop laughing. Uh, <laughs> but, so one of the things that Microsoft has is a crap load of money sitting around not doing much. It's very true. Why not improve Origin? Well, you, you couldn't make it worse. That's a good uh, point. Oh, no, that's uh, not Have true. you ever tried buying a game from the Microsoft store? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah I have. Mm-hmm. Origin works so, a hell of a lot so, better. So, so let, let, me, uh, let me posit these. Player Unknown Battlegrounds uh, just released a new Battle Royale, and I, f- I forget what it was, but it was something like $4.5 billion this thing has generated in the short time it's been around. Yeah. And, you know, it sort of like you saw it with uh, my, Minecraft. I mean, the guy might be thinking, all right, I've done it. Let's move on to something else. So like an island. Yeah. I can move on to an island with $4.6 billion. You know, exactly. And you don't have to think about anything anymore. Yeah. Valve, on the other hand, that's a bit worrisome. Yeah. Steam, uh, as much as there are people who have issues about how Valve has implemented Steam, is a ridiculously easy way to pick up games and to curate them. And, you know, to spend a whole bunch of money when the stale pops up for no reason who whatsoever. Owns, who owns Valve today? I don't is know. it Gabe? It's, it's a private company. Right. Yeah, it's private. I'm there's trying to figure no, out, is Gabe the majority no owner? There's no way Gabe sells his company to Microsoft. I think yeah. he'd rather burn it to the ground. I think you're right. Than sell it to Microsoft. Right. But I, all of my library of unplayed games. Like, don't get me wrong. I think there's, there'd be a lot of value for Microsoft to buy it and oh, yeah. take over that service if they didn't screw it up. Like, there's a lot of potential there. But they, they created Steam OS specifically to screw Microsoft, right? Yes. It didn't work great as they'd expected, right? It wasn't the most perfect initiative, but it, it's fine. But it, like, they hate Microsoft, the whole idea of the store and restrictions and all this thing w- was something they went against. So that would be a shock to me. I, I think it would sneak in and RMRF all the servers before something <laughs> and yes. deal with the lawsuits for the next 50 years. Uh, and, Microsoft, and we all know that Microsoft isn't going to learn from Steam. They're, they're going uh, to change it over to their Microsoft store format yeah, and just destroy I have, a, I have a little bit more faith in the current leadership at Microsoft than I yeah. would have said three or five years ago. Um but I yes, I don't think that they would adopt. Hey, if Microsoft buys Steam and they can fix the scaling issue with the software and Windows, <laughs> I think that's worth it. Um, Microsoft buying EA is more interesting. Like, ever, imagine if like every EA game was an Xbox and Windows exclusive. Uh, that would be a. It's like suddenly millions of gamers thing. found a single focus for their hate. Well, sure, it is. It, it's a it's a difficult proposition to buy the most hated company. Uh, you know, that wins that award all the time. Um, PUBG makes sense, too, because yep. you'd still keep it on Windows. It's already an Xbox exclusive, right? Yeah, it is. for now. For now, least. but they could tie it up that yeah. way. If I'm, if, I'm, uh, if I'm Microsoft, I would say when you bought Minecraft, Minecraft had been so established for so long mm-hmm. that it made sense to buy it. And, and it's still apparently a profit. And they're still putting out Minecraft on different platforms yeah. that aren't Microsoft owned. That's true. They've done a very good job with that. Yeah. And they've been very open with it. But, but like PUBG, it might PUBG would be very similar to that. But but you're buying it at its most expensive point, right? Like yeah. clearly this is this is peak PUBG mm. at this point. You don't think so? Well, it still hasn't had like it's still in the early access program on consoles, and I think like when it gets a full release, there will be a lot more. I have sales. I have four or five friends of mine who I never would have considered to be hardcore gamers that play PUBG almost every night, 
right? On Xbox. Yeah. And they, because yeah, I'm that, in that's that group exactly text, what right? You think this is that, like, if it gets a full release and they do an actual marketing push behind it, maybe, yeah, then they sell yeah. a lot more. I think, so I think, it depending on what that cost is, I don't think it happens with Valve. I, I just EA don't see, I don't see how it helps Microsoft that much. Sure, you buy the most popular game in the world again, like you did with Minecraft. Yeah, just, but you, you need more, you need quantity. You don't, right, need, right, right. Just like give them a couple hundred million dollars more and keep it an Xbox and Windows exclusive as opposed to taking it to the PS4. Save yourself a little money. I think the developer will be fine with that. And, you know, don't buy Valve, please. Whatever you do. Uh, Corsair uh, released a keyboard. Did they announce this at CES? And it's just kind of finally being released? I don't know. But this is a uh, this is a Josh Proof K68 not RGB po- mechanical gaming keyboard. Not possible. Now look at it. It's, it's waterproof. IP32 no. waterproof. IP32. I hope you're talking about... Uh, drool and spittle <laughs> that's what i meant that's what i meant ip32 oh, sure. water and dust resistant shielding um how do you do Does, that did with DCS cherry switches? have a hand in this you have to i don't know how, have how have do you do shield. how do you do that with cherry switches Sometimes. i wouldn't have thought it would you have to put like some rubber thing no, like around like diaphragms inside around yeah, the there's, there's diaphragms underneath all of them uh, oh, okay. i believe if and you head over to the site the uh, corsair link uh, but dump, dump. Let's do it. And they scroll down about halfway. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Keep going. One more. Keep going. One more. It's a long Keep oh, there, it there you go. Oh. There okay. you go. Where's derp, the? Derp. Oh, there's like a membrane of her everything. Oh. I wonder if that changes the feel of stuff. Uh, it, no. It, it shouldn't affect. It's only a really thin membrane. <laughs> 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 Some say it does, Ryan. Some guys. say it does. <laughs> oh my God. It's still better than nothing. <laughs> uh. Because because the 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 rubber uh, has keep, to compress with the switch, keep, right? Keep that. <laughs> not I guess you, maybe not if it's just a resistance. Not, not all a the proof. sensation passes through. Yeah, yeah. Like oh, you just Lord. designed the keycaps so that they completely clear the rubber, like that they. Yeah, don't I doubt the, the keycaps actually are hitting anything, or the rubber is interfering with anything. Because the keycaps well, you'll, you'll are still a stand get a satisfying going in click. that in that cross there. <laughs> Yeah. So like yeah. they're not actually actually. It's not that funny. I don't even know what he's laughing right. at anymore. I don't know what you do that involves mind, a click, but that's his mind not is already in the gutter. Everything is a sexual innuendo. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. does it come in sheepskin? Uh, yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> the, oh, that's the K sixty nine. What is happening? So Josh is going to review this uh, keyboard next week for us, and uh, he'll get back to you. Yeah. yeah. No, I'll thanks. test this resistance to I think, fluids. I think we're getting one of these in relatively soon. I will immediately just put it in the sink and see if it still works. <laughs> I don't know. It won't. Oh. Well, we need the Logitech for that. It said, not be harmed if water is dripped on it flat or up to a 15-degree angle. Okay. So it gives Drift you some... Dripped not submerged. No, yeah, you want yeah. this bad boy if you got spill a your Diet Coke on it. Uh, if I pour my yeah. Diet Coke across it, that's what I'm looking for. What's that? A good old Logitech. Yeah. She's waterproof. No, I did. Does it mention pricing it on here? 119 bucks. So yeah. not terribly outside the realm of other mechanical keyboards. Yeah, it's, so it's like par for the course at this point. It has the RGB. Yeah, it has the RGBs and it's cherry red or blue. I mean, that so keyboard, actually less that keyboard without thought, the protection so. used to be like 150 bucks. All right, a couple of last things here. And actually, we may skip the last one because we talked about it so much. Uh, Vivo, big Chinese cell phone manufacturer, is releasing a phone called the X-Play 7 that's going to have 10 gigabytes of RAM Why? in it. Because Android, dog. I don't know. Like, But it uses more battery. You're trying to keep 10 gig of RAM lit up. I, well, I don't know. It might oh, be. But it's got 10 they don't gigs think of the RAM. market is constrained enough. <laughs> yeah. Stop taking 10 gig of RAM and sticking it in the dang GBs. So, I mean, it's uh, starting I, in the middle of last year. There were, there were phones were shipping with 8 gigs of RAM, right? I, I, I get it, but right? still. And so now like, they've bumped it up to 10. How many apps do you need? 10 gigabytes worth. All the apps. I don't Alan, know. how many All tabs do you keep open on your desktop? No, I get that. What if but could do that on But your smartphones phone? don't generally work that way. What if they, they did? They could. But so this is going to be using apparently, according to these leak slides, the Snapdragon 845 processor, 10 gigs of RAM, 256 gig or 512 gigs of internal storage, and uh, a uh, uh, in-display fingerprint sensor plus functionality call that the company is calling Face ID 2.0. Oh, so, shit. <laughs> so that's not going to make it outside of the Chinese market. <laughs> Inevitably. I mean, Can you mine idea. on it? <laughs> Probably. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, what, what drives me crazy about this RAM thing is I saw like a comparison. Like somebody was comparing some Android phone to some iPhone, right? 
Yeah. And they were like they do. side by side, but he went through and he executed and then quit and went back to the home screen. Every single app on the front, like the front page full of apps, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was like 16 or 20 apps he went through mm-hmm. as fast as they would launch and then go back to the home screen. And like, and then he went through it a second time to show, oh, how many of these are still on the RAM? Like, how many people are going through 20 different freaking apps in rapid succession? I think you'd succession? be surprised how many apps the average person goes through in the course of a day. And also, I don't think the is iPhone one is actually keeping this in RAM. I think it has a lot of cache on the CPU and it has very fast storage. Yeah, if anything, so it yeah. seems if anything, like the load isn't very That's still long. one of my biggest right. complaints about the iPhone is that it when likes I, to it likes to quit like stuff when in the I background. go back into a Safari tab it shouldn't have to reload yeah, it, yeah. right and it's that's very, that's a system memory it's very aggressive uh, issue yeah it is and, it, and and because it's very aggressive it performs very well Android doesn't have that flexibility or they choose not to use it or they don't integrate or whatever it is there's some difference there clearly um, but whatever so hey 10 gigabyte smartphones uh, it's coming. Quick. Technoscope wants to run a Linux VM on his phone without his phone slowing down. That's Hell yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> now we can do it. There you go, man. The How about you go. Yeah. Two, that two extra gigs is going to make a very big difference. Um, Jeremy, is there anything about this last story we need to touch on, or do we get to that during all the Intel talk? Uh, well, there is one interesting point, uh, which comes out with uh, Brian Krasanich saying that a new Intel chip will arrive in 2018, which is completely immune to Spectre and Meltdown. Oh, okay. That's more than we were talking about earlier. Okay. So Cannon Lake is taped out, right? Like it's yes. done. Yeah. One would assume. So it can't be Cannon Lake. Well, I mean, it, they could do another stepping really quick. Yeah. Before they and, and then toss like, all the other ones out. They well, could. No. Well, or they could I mean, rebrand it as the secure <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, version of Cannon Russia Lake Pro. Yeah. Rebrand the old one as the insecure version. <laughs> I don't think that's a good call. My question is, does that mean that Ice Lake might actually be being pushed up into this year? Probably towards the end of the year, but I mean, I think is that... That's a, that's a completely different architecture yeah. than Which, Cannon Lake, in right? theory, so, would be immune. Well, uh, I mean, in theory, Security Lake. I don't think they would have changed <laughs> that. So Security. I don't think they would have changed that before all this started coming to light. So, uh, so what... Chip could it be I that's no coming idea. out that they can flat out say it's immune to Spectre and Meltdown? Kind of like refresh. <laughs> no. they, did, they didn't even yeah. really say that it would ne- that it would be like a consumer part or a widely distributed part. Maybe it's so like something specific for their top enterprise customers that they need to more, provide More that concerned to, about the right? performance. Yeah, and that might be an option. Yeah. They need actually. Intel Kitty Pool processors. That, that'd be where they'd be willing to spend a lot more money to get the fix out yeah. sooner. Right. As opposed to the consumer space where it's more of an optics problem than a real problem today, right? That could all change, but today. Yep. Now, now there's been there, there's been some noise on the the kernel mailing list in the past two weeks that I honestly have not been completely caught up on, um, and they're from what I've understood of it, they're talking about adding a a a processor flag for enabling a mode that somehow like hobbles the speculative execution on it without sure. a major architecture change. Yeah. Um, but it's, people aren't happy about it at all. It's shocking. Yeah. Cause it, it it's not a, <laughs> it's not a feature shocking. flag and how it's implemented. Like you have to, you have to put some code on the actual OS boot up to either turn it on or turn it off, depending right. mm. if your workarounds are in place. So it's ugh. a, it's a, a kludge. As we would call on the sub. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a this is a major half aspects. It's a major architectural problem that goes back twenty years, and you're not going to fix it overnight. And they or if you do, it's going to have some some serious like repercussions performance wise, right? And so they have to balance both of those options. So, Uh, is there anything else in this last one other than I wanted to show this picture that Jeremy put in here (laughs) of uh, (laughs) guy with the binoculars? I mean, this is probably the last time we'll talk about this, right? I mean, we'll probably never talk about (laughs) Spectre and uh, uh, Meltdown Uh, ever again. We didn't mention it here, but Microsoft did possible Microsoft did roll back between Lenovo and uh, the Chinese government. Microsoft rolled back which one, the Spectre or the Meltdown one? Yes. I don't know the answer. I think it's just the Spectre. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I, did we talk about last week the reboot issues? I'm yeah. sure we did, we, right? We talked about the rollback yes. last week, I thought. We did. We talked about reboot issues, but that rollback was not the Microsoft rollback. That one happened. That was Intel's request days. for you to not update. Now, Microsoft released a patch that actually undoes yeah. 
the patches. Yeah. They're my favorite patches from Microsoft. So and it added some registry you, keys so you can turn it on and off. And if stuff you ask like me that. today, if I update my machine all the way, is it patched? The answer is I don't know the answer to that. Uh, yeah. I think the answer is no. It's probably not. But it might be yeah. dependent on the processor you use. Like maybe did they not undo the patches for AMD processors, but they did for Intel? I don't know that either. I don't know the answer to that. So we will be supplying a link later on the tonight where you can download our version of Spectre and test to see if you're vulnerable <laughs> or not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, when, your CPU, during, when, your when you're CPU, when you're doing starts, banking applications, right, right, right. Or, you know, if your CPU starts spinning up with mining prompts, it, just ignore it. It's totally fine. Yeah. Except for the touch. Except. It's not a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Before we get into our hardware software picks of the week, we had two more Patreon things to come in. Daniel Padilla, who already upped his pledge from three to five earlier today, has now upped his pledge from five to 10 before the end of the show. Sweet. Thank Ooh. you very much, David. And Cronark. Uh, Cronark with a Q edited their pledge to ten dollars from nine dollars to ten dollars. So thank you guys both. What is that from? It's from something. Uh, it's from this email I got. Well, I know that's that. true. Yeah. All right, picks. Sounds Klingon vaguely. I, I think you're worried. Uh, yeah, the the God of War. What was his name? Uh, Crow Crow something. That was Crom? Crom? Magnum Man. Me- oh, Mega Man. <laughs> Mega Man. I don't know. Uh, all right. Picks of the Yo week. Soy. Picks of the week. Picks of the, the, picks of the, the week. Picks of the week. Picks of the week. How about anyway. an APC battery backup? I'm pretty sure I've recommended one of these sometime last year. Kratos. Uh, you recommended Kratos. the Cyber Power one. <clears throat> yeah. Kratos. Josh, we've moved on. Yeah. So there was a Cyber Power one that was on sale. Uh. So you're talking about a GPS, but you have a game up, or did we lose it again? You must have lost it again. Oh, son of a. Oh. There it is. All right, there it is. So this you, is you an need APC an uninterruptible network supply. Fi- yeah, no joke. Yeah. Fifteen hundred uh, VA, nine hundred watt backup. It looks like it's out of stock. Of course, now that I, I clicked on it earlier today, um, <clears throat> we had a power outage at the office for about four <laughs> hours one day, um, where like it was out for a whole air part of a big part of the area. All the ups has died, and um, yeah, we actually had it's the first time I've ever had like UPSs die, and they all died with us taking affirmative action. The only UPSs we had running were the network gear. Network yeah. gear, yeah, right. Like we, right. Like we, we shut almost, down all of our machines. Yeah, we shut everything down right away. <laughs> and um, Well, not the laptops. Like the router, like the ONT was still working. The router was working. The the access points were working. The switches were working. And I think I think that battery backup claimed when the power went out that we had like 140 minutes, 130 minutes of yep. battery time. And I thought, well, that'll be plenty of time. We've yeah, never had sure. power. It'll be back up. Of course not. Nope. It was gone. Um, interestingly, that power supply, I don't know if you guys, anybody else has ever had this happen, but when the power was restored, that UPS didn't come back on. The itself. cyber power one. Oh, the cyber the, power one. Yeah, uh, not the one I'm recommending here. A the cyber of, power one. A lot of UPSs, if you completely exhaust them, will not come back on. Why? Because they want your user to be there to do it. That's stupid. It was off for an extended period of time. It, it's, it's, it's to avoid flapping. Well, there's that. Yep. It, it doesn't know... It doesn't know if it's like in a state where it's been shipped or like it's totally dead. Like everything, it's everything's reset. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it, I mean, it's probably not all the way dead. Sure, but it's depleted and like, yeah. you know. I don't know. I, I was hey, annoyed. Let me ask you a question, Ryan. Oh, uh, please, and the, God. This is do. something that Xmas brought up. Okay. Why don't you plug your, your Tesla into. We could have reversed I, I the polarity. It, I believe when yeah, we yeah, believe is what they say, and that's, that's, uh, as they say, push, push it back in. Yeah, um, dilithium crystals, right, Mr. Mm-hmm. Fusion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there yeah. was, I think, I believe it was the first time in my life ever when I wasn't out of town that I went to a coffee shop to do work. Yeah, right. Like I went to Starbucks and I sat there for an hour and a half trying to do writing and email and stuff because I I sat here in the dark answering emails on my laptop until the networking gear died. So long story short, we bought a few more of these. Uh, we found some some mission critical stuff that needed to be on them again. We're just going to daisy chain them, them in a row. Yeah. <laughs> put four in a row. I'm sure that's how that works. The one right? at the end will die, and then the next Infinite one. Infinite power. Yeah. yeah, I believe that's what it is. And we we I seriously looked at like uh, like gas generator, uh, like natural gas generators. They're not, yeah. they're not stupid expensive, like three grand to supply the power to the whole building. Um, it's not bad. It's it's not as bad as I thought. I had no idea what to expect, but that's not installed. But yes, so well, um, I think for your needs, you just run an extension cord out the back and fire it up. Yeah, natural gas. One generator? extension cord. Oh, you're talking about CNG. Natural never, gas. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, yeah. 
like that's a little different. Like this was this was for a two hundred amp service. generator. Yeah, two hundred amp service generator. Really, uh, only three grand. That's, 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 that's surprisingly good. That's I mean, really nice. Yeah, because two hundred amp. Costco, Costco, like Costco sells everything, man. An outlet at Costco. That's what it was. Costco. Yeah. Jesus. Members Mark brand. No, wait, that's Sam's Club. Uh, Kirkland. Kirkland brand. Yeah, oh, wait, you know what? <laughs> you know what? It, it had a 200 amp switch. That does not mean it can produce 200 amps. I will look it up. I disagree. Because, maybe. because the switch, it's supposed to be wired into your main. Yes, correct. You have 200 amp yeah. service. Correct. That's a common number mm -hmm. for service. So you need a Very. switch. You know, something has to switch your main over to mm -hmm. the generator. Mm -hmm. So the switch is rated for 200. Okay. Yeah, the, I'll, I'll look up at the generator. Two hundred amps is but... like it's a lot of freaking kilowatts. Hell yeah, two hundred times two twenty. Answer for you. Uh, yeah, it's already oh, in. running in his squirrel cage. Jeremy, what do you got for me? All right, so honestly, I despise crafting games. Uh, I've barely played Fallout Four just purely because of that. Mm -hmm. But Subnautica looked just utterly gorgeous and relaxing. Uh, so I did pick it up figuring, all right, at worst, I'll just play a couple hours and return it if it's awful. There's a switch where you can say, turn off eating and drinking necessity. And you just swim around chasing alien fishies and occasionally, you know, crafting something cause you want to be underwater for a little bit longer. And it, it's just ridiculously pretty yeah, it does and a hell of really a lot nice. of fun and mm -hmm. relaxing. It's just nice to be able to swim around for an hour instead of, you know, stressing about a game that, you know, oh, if I make a bad decision, horrible things are going to happen or I'm going to die. This thing, you can't kill anything uh, and you can't die. You just respawn again in your little compart your little uh, safety pod. I, it's just over 20 bucks. It's 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 worth doing. Interesting. It's just ridiculously silly fun. I believe we call this Alex generator Alex simulator 20. 18. <laughs> <laughs> this, that's yeah. what you do when you go on yes. diving trips, right? Yeah, that's yeah, what you were yeah. doing. It was I've gone for two weeks. weeks. Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, Jeremy, and, I probably uh, saw it's Alex in this game. So if you've got a headset, you can huh. do it in VR. Oh, great. Right, Josh? Perfect. Do it in VR, huh? I can. I do a lot of things. No, I don't do anything <laughs> in VR. All right, Josh, what do you got for me? I forgot. <laughs> Doesn't matter. All right, next. All right. Uh, no, it's uh, me down. I got a, a relatively tomorrow. inexpensive uh, Threadripper cooler. Ooh. It's solid. It's like 39 bucks. Hmm. Hey, that's it's that. got good airflow. It's got a, mm -hmm. an that's elongated oh. base to cover quite a bit of the Threadripper core. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's elongated. You know, for only 40 bucks, I mean, you're not going to overclock with this thing. Don't, don't think that it is the second coming. But it is a solid chunk of metal Look at the and colors. decent pans that will uh, keep you happy. It's eSports yellow, the red Ryan. Is that what it says? eSports yellow. eSports yellow. Yellow. eSports green. You're yellow, damn e it. eSports red. They're all eSports colors. Yeah, Except that's good. Yeah. Good pick. All right. And uh, Alan, last. So uh, I'm not sure if this thing is going to be uh, the sale sale's still going to be going like Which tomorrow. one am I clicking on? Because you think you gave me like uh, Well, there's two on the page. That's why I just did that link. Oh, nope, okay. Nope. So there's like a solar powered like. I was. This is so annoying. 15,000 milliamp hours. No. So in other words, 15 amp hours. But that's pretty big for a battery. Yeah. Uh, and it's got like solar cells on it and all sorts of other cool stuff. It's like twenty two dollars okay. on Amazon. Like that's how long do you think it takes to recharge that? Probably in like a full long sunlight? time. <laughs> uh, I was thinking that to myself, but like, hey, at least it's got something. At least it will. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, sure. if you're out, you know, camping or something, maybe it'd come in handy. Uh, you charge it in a pinch, and then if you want more power but less solar, you spend a few more bucks and you scroll down to the the one underneath that more other power, charger. More power, less solar. Yeah, there's just there's no solar on that. Didn't we see that at CES? Did oh, that's the have, Vancouver uh, version, is it? Well, that's the that's the 20, <laughs> 20 thousand milliamp hour, or just twenty amp hour version. Yeah, uh, pretty crazy battery sizes you can get for like really dirt cheap. It wasn't too long ago these things used to be kind of pricey. Yeah, you know they used to be like that could be like when those first came out, like hundred bucks or something. Remember, remember How big those, is the bloody those fuel thing? cell. Power things. Yes. It's like oh, a, yeah, that was like a three little pressurized CSs capsules ago. that you yeah. put in. Yeah. Can't believe that didn't really take it. off. Yeah. Just, you know, probably hard to get on the I'm airplane. I'm going to take this on the plane. Yeah, Here you I was, was going to say. <laughs> be, 
uh, going through TSA. What is yeah, it? Well, that's that's pressurized natural gas. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, sir. Well, no, it's totally fine. Oh, I'll here, show you how yeah. it works. How about this other one that runs on hydrogen? It's just a hydrogen canister. <laughs> uh, oh, well. All right, there you go. Uh, that's it for this episode, guys. PCPro.com slash podcast. Obviously, the URL you go to to find episodes, links, show notes. I do want to bring up here at the end uh, all the stuff that happened since last week's episode. There was a YouTube video that came out that questioned a lot of stuff that we do and how we do it. And I don't want to get into all the details there uh, or here, rather, uh, other than to say we strongly believe that a significant portion – of the claims made in that video were proved wrong uh, in in several places. If you want to see the entirety of like my 3000 word response to that, you can go to the thread in uh, it's in slash r slash hardware uh, seemed like the most appropriate common place that didn't try to bring ad money into us or into YouTube or something like that. So that's where we put all that. Um, like I said, many of the things in there, most of the things in there were wrong. Uh, but there were a couple of constructive criticisms in there, just not uh, presented in the, I believe, optimal way uh, about, you know, hey, we basically disclose disclosing, stuff, yeah. disclosing stuff about, hey, what is Shroud Research and what, is it, what does it do and how, what is its relationship to PC Per? Mm-hmm. And we've talked about it on this show many times. We've talked about stories that I've written on MarketWatch on this show and on the website and interlinked. So none of it was ever uh, uh, attempted to be hidden. But now what you'll see on some reviews like 760. this one, if I go to the first page, if you go to the bottom of the first page of, of this story now, you will see these types of disclosures, basically talking about not just the, the, the Shrout research angle of things, but how did we get the product? Did we buy it? Did it come from a vendor? Mm-hmm. Is it on loan? Did we, did we purchase it? Do we have to send it back? Um, did we consult them before the publication of the review for any technical expertise? you know, like expertise or questions, those types of things. Does that person advertise with us or have they advertised with us? All that stuff is now laid out for everybody to see. And I also want to emphasize, this was always our stance. We didn't change our stance or our position Mm -hmm. because of anything that happened over the last week, but it's a fair claim to say that, Hey, you weren't telling us that overtly. You weren't very transparent. So now we're telling you that overtly Mm -hmm. about what we're doing. Uh, And I still believe that we have, the most honest team. I don't want to say the most honest team. I want, I'm not trying to discredit other websites. Most right? honest. <laughs> and we, have the, we are the best. <laughs> I believe that we have a very honest team of people, a very honest organization. I think we have the readers uh, in our minds when we're doing all this type of stuff. But there it all is laid out now. Uh, and like I said, if you want to read a detailed response to the specific video that I'm referring to, go to r slash hardware. Uh, and uh, find that thread there. Maybe we'll link it in the show notes to this video, and just the, so that's referenced somewhere in there. I don't want to come. The chat wants a Walworth research. That's Josh Tech that already that's true. exists. Yes. And nobody complained about that. I know, right? Right. You know, I know. I was, that really hurt my feelings. Nobody I, mentioned me I know, in right? any videos. <laughs> we're not. We're done. We're not talking about any of it. Stop. We're done. See you next week, guys. Yep. Bye.